Vampire Hunter D. Bloodlust is a movie that captivates from the get-go, with richly detailed art and animation, dense landscapes with sprawling tapestries of implied sci-fi lore, compellingly complex characters, and a story that wades through all kinds of morally murky waters. But strangely, what appeals to me most is the melancholy that lingers throughout its runtime. It's defined by this haunting sense of sorrow as its characters chase dreams they'll never reach and fight for ideals they know were already dead. And today, I want to talk about how these tragic qualities bleed into nearly every part of this film and why, for me, they make it work so well. And I want to start with how it was brought together in the first place. For anyone who may not know, Vampire Hunter D. Bloodless is a dark fantasy anime film from the year 2000 directed by Yoshiaki Kawajiri, produced by Madhouse, and based on the third installment of the Vampire Hunter D. novel series, Demon Death Case, by Hideaki Kikuchi. It takes place thousands of years in the future, long after a nuclear war has reduced the world to a post-apocalyptic wasteland and the subsequent rise and fall of a class of vampires who established themselves as nobles in this new world, as the humans they took control of fight back against their reign of terror. The story follows D, a Dampier, or half-vampire, half-human, vampire hunter cursed with a parasitic talking left hand who's hired to rescue a young girl named Charlotte from the clutches of a noble known as Mayor Link. However, he's not the only one who's been tasked with this perilous mission, as he quickly finds himself competing against a band of fellow hunters known as the Marcus Brothers. Borgoff, Kyle, Nolt, Grove, and Layla for his bounty, and along the way runs into all kinds of monstrosities and impossibilities, as they find out that there's more to this mission than they'd initially been told. And from the first frame, it's clear to see the passion that's been poured into this movie. It's stuffed to bursting with stunning animations, striking imagery, haunting environments, and distinctive designs. But it's also an aspect of the production that, in part, seems to have been pulled from disappointment. Because this wasn't Vampire Hunter D's first animated outing. In 1985, a film simply titled Vampire Hunter D, directed by Toyo Ashido, produced by Ashi Productions, and based on the first novel of the series, was released. It follows the titular D after being hired by a young girl named Doris to help her kill the vampire who's bitten her before she can transform. It was quite popular at the time, and quickly became notable not only for being an early example of an anime film with an explicitly adult audience in mind, so much so that despite a theatrical run, it relied more on VHS sales to recoup its budget because of said market's growing demand for more graphic and mature content, but also for being an anime film that primarily draws upon European inspirations for its horror. However, despite its success, Kikuchi wasn't satisfied. The film had quite a limited budget, and though it looked better than most TV anime, it was still a step down from many other animated features at the time, including, quite ironically, another adaptation of one of Kikuchi's novels, Wicked City directed by Yoshiaki Kawajiri, which released just two years later. Over time, fans of the series and the film expressed a growing interest in seeing Vampire Hunter D done right, especially after comments made by Kikuchi about how cheap he felt the original film looked. But it wouldn't be until nearly 12 years later in 1997 that Kikuchi, several Vampire Hunter D novels later, would be contacted by Madhouse, a studio that at the time was known for its work not only on the aforementioned Wicked City, but also on the likes of Ninja Scrolls and Perfect Blue, the latter being the directorial debut of the late Satoshi Kon, to discuss the possibility of creating another Vampire Hunter D film, with hopes of having Kawajiri, who by this time had grown a reputation for bringing together sci-fi, fantasy, and horror in spectacular particularly gruesome ways to direct, and, well, I'm sure you can tell where things went from there. Bloodlust production came together from a simple desire to outdo the lacking artistic quality of the series' initial outing. And not only do I think they achieved that, I think they knocked it out of the park. So too was one of the most distinct aspects of both the film and the series pulled from a similar situation. Its setting. It draws from so many different genres and aesthetics to create its universe. 
From the abandoned technologies of the old world rusting in the wild to the grotesquely futuristic designs of the ones that remain. It's gothic architecture sculpting an ostentatiously ominous atmosphere for its cities and crumbling ruins while pushing them to their stylistic extremes. In the luscious red archways and towering spires of Carmilla's blood-stained castle, or the uneven bulk of Mayor Link's manor standing in stark contrast to the stiff, geometric and cross-riddled structures of the town stuck in its shadow. All the while wrapped up in the spaghetti western tone left by its vast, dry plains and rocky outcrops scorched by the sun, and the lonely wanderings of its money-driven mercenaries across its wild landscape. Something that's only bolstered by the revolver-looking guns and Old West clothes that so much of its society seems to trade in. And the more I dive into Vampire Hunter D, the more ridiculous the connections between those tropes and ideas become, as its lore is littered with rumours of factories that create monsters for the nobles, weather controlling stations, and power plants that siphon energy from alternate universes. Vampire Hunter D mixes and matches the genres it takes inspiration from to such a degree that it's hard to find the line between them. But it wasn't originally meant to be that way. As Kikuchi himself explains in an interview for Anime Expo in 2015, the decision to blend his horror story with different genres was originally more of a marketing gimmick than anything else. <laughs> ホラーを描くと言っただけでおそらく失敗者出してくれなかったでしょう。ですから私はあのあれを描くとあのビーを描くときにまずあの超未来の話にした。超未来の話にすると当然これは SF it seems like a lot of the peculiarities of Vampire Hunter D's world only came about because of the original author's fears that his story wouldn't get anywhere without them. And for as disheartening as that is, it let him experiment and blur the line of those influences to create something unique. Many of Bloodlust's most iconic details stemmed from less than ideal situations that pushed its creators to find clever ways to work around them, or in some cases, forced them to start over, but as a result, let them pull some fantastic work out of those disappointments. And more than anything else, I think goes to show how easy it can be to make the best of a bad situation. But there is one part of Bloodlust production that I don't think landed nearly as well as the film would have liked it to. Before I say anything else on this topic, while I don't think there's anything wrong with having a personal preference for watching subs or dubs for specific shows or in general, I think the arguments about which is inherently or objectively better is… stupid, honestly. Especially since many of the more aggressive points of said discussions greatly oversimplify and often reveal the arguer's lack of knowledge about the complicated intricacies that go into the dubbing process as well as translation and localization as a whole, on which there are plenty of videos that go into great detail to explain them that, for anyone interested, I will link in the description and cards of this video. And while I do tend to watch subs more often, simply because they're the first ones available, I don't really have a preference one way or the other. All that said, in this specific case, I personally think the English dub for Bloodlust is less than stellar. While it certainly has a certain 90s camp kind of charm to it and gets across the characters' personalities pretty well, from the well-spoken ringleader of the Barbroy, So I see you have dismounted. You have respect for your elders. That's very considerate indeed. The in-your-face attitude of the Marcus Brothers' many members. Yeah! Come and get it, zombies! Or the nervous backtalk of Dee's left hand. Did you ever hear the expression, too close for comfort, because that, that was damn uncomfortable. The delivery of said lines varies wildly, flipping back and forth in tone literally from sentence to sentence. Yeah, that's right, the castle. The castle of Chase. What are you thinking? We can't go in there, it would be suicide! The lines themselves either feel rushed out. I see you are a very humorous young man, and beautiful too, I might have. Oh, does that make you uncomfortable to have an old wench like me admire you so? Or stretched out. He thinks that's unfair! Three against one, how unfair! Three against one, unfair! The voice acting is often only barely audible over the sound effects and ambiance. Took my sister and killed my friends. And the dialogue itself leaves little room for ambiguity each line going out of its way to spell everything out as explicitly as it can. Trust me, I know how they think these vampires. When they threaten, they all head for Barbaro. They're so predictable. Barbaro, yeah. I really hate that place. Full of lunatics and monsters and that old crazy man, you know? 
I just don't think the dub is quite up to scratch. And that lack of ambiguity is especially frustrating as I feel like it sands the edge off of the story. The film's characters and their actions revolve around a strange set of ethics and values and it's something that's continually highlighted as the film goes on. Not only revealing how Charlotte is actually trying to run away with Mayer, but also how detached its heroes are from the idealism their professions would imply. We should just let her kill herself. And then we can finish him off. What do you think about that idea? We get the money if she's dead or alive. Hey, you're right. It's also something that the crew behind the dub seemed well aware of. This is a very unusual story because it's very layered and there's a lot of moral ambiguity. And I think that will, that will appeal to a more uh, sophisticated audience. And yet, at every turn, the dialogue feels like it's constantly trying to reassure the audience about who is and isn't good and bad. Something that's especially obvious in comparison to the Japanese version of the film, which leaves those answers uncomfortably vague. I think the best example of this comes about halfway through the film, when, after stopping by a lake to repair and rest, Mayer lets Charlotte leave to enjoy the sun while she still can, and instructs his minions to leave her be as she explores the overgrown ruins they've stopped in. That's when Charlotte runs into D. I am D, a hunter. Your father sent me. Don't be afraid. I won't hurt you. You sit in the sunlight. You must not be changed. So why do you stay with him? Kizoku in the dub, D goes out of his way to let Charlotte know he's trying to help and that he's not a threat. But in the sub, he just stands there, menacingly, his intentions unclear and unreadable. And it's easy to imagine how in that silence, Charlotte could assume a thousand different terrifying things about what the shadowy figure wants. The sub is more than willing to let its narrative linger in that ambiguity, where there's no clear-cut right or wrong way to view it. Something that I don't think the dub has the confidence to let itself even try. And of course, you might be wondering why I'm even discussing this in the first place. If the dub isn't good, then surely I could just watch the original Japanese version and forget about it, right? Well, that's the thing. The English dub is the original version. Vampire Hunter D. Bloodlust is meant to be an English language film. One of the companies that collaborated on Bloodlust was Urban Vision Entertainment, a distributor that was founded in 1996 by Mateichiro Yamamoto, a veteran producer within the anime industry looking to get in on the growing international demand for anime productions, especially in the US. Some of the first films the company picked up were the original Vampire Hunter D film and Wicked City, and during negotiations with Madhouse for the license to the latter, Madhouse mentioned that they were working on a new Vampire Hunter D film, and Yamamoto was instantly interested, not only in getting involved in the production, but also in trying to get this film a theatrical release in America, and part of that strategy involved making it more accessible to American audiences through an English dub, which ended up being recorded and released before the Japanese version. Hell, to this day, due to those licensing agreements, every Western release of the film, whether VHS, DVD, or Blu-ray, only has the English language option available to watch, which certainly made it a pain to actually find the compared Japanese version with it in the first place. So, YouTube ended up being quite a help in that regard? Because people using the audio-visual medium the site provides to comment, critique, and analyze media in a transformative way protected by fair use, that's a problem that must be dealt with immediately because copyright. But illegal uploads of said pieces of media, unedited, uncut, unfiltered, and in HD quality that those copyright systems were originally meant to stop from happening? That's fine, apparently, because you can fucking find them fucking everywhere on the site very fucking easily. Paranorman? On YouTube. Angel's Egg? On YouTube. Fucking Legend of the Overfiend? You know, the edgy, violent anime film full of blood, gore, body horror, nudity, demon, and tentacle rape completely uncut? All on YouTube! And not only was it age-restricted, it was also marked as fucking children's content! YouTube! Your system is drunk off its ass! Send it home already! Look, me losing my absolute fucking mind aside, it's just weird to see how a production built to be in English ended up with what feels like such a lackluster dub. There have been some rumors that the dub used was originally only meant to be a scratch track, but the production ended up running so tight on schedule that they weren't able to find the time to replace it, and so just worked with what they had. But that is just speculation, as I have, as of yet, been unable to find anything that actually confirms this other than internet hearsay. 
But whatever the reason, I think the results speak for themselves, as one of the most unique and ambitious aspects of Bloodlust as a film, while functional, I think just falls flat. However, even with that in mind, I think it still manages to get across the movie's core appeal, especially in regards to its titular I am fascinated by D as a character, not just because of his calm, quiet air of beauty and badassery, but also because of the way his position as the film's technical hero melds with his mixed feelings about the circumstances of his existence and how it connects him to the cruelty of his vampiric brethren. For context, I think the situation with the vampires and humans in this film represents class conflict in a very broad sense of the term. As mentioned before, the vampires not only became the de facto rulers of this world following its post-nuclear destruction, but they're also referred to as nobles, as in nobility, as in aristocrats, as in upper class, as in... I don't know how to make this any more clear. They live in extravagant but distant castles and manors that dominate the landscape. At worst, they see humanity as livestock to keep them fed, and at best, as things to be used. It's a mentality even Mayer, the most sympathetic of the nobles, falls into, as he turns an entire town of humans into an undead horde to act as a barrier of defense to his castle and slow down anyone looking to harm him. The vampires of Vampire Hunter D. Bloodlust are the literal and thematic upper class of its world. And it makes a lot of sense, since in my experience at least, that kind of depiction of vampires is one of the more traditional ways in which they've been used in fiction, as on-the-nose metaphors for the upper classes of society. Many classic vampires are counts, lords, kings, and sometimes are even based in part or in whole on real-life individuals of that same stature, including the archetypal father of vampires himself, Count Dracula, who was inspired by Vlad the Impaler of Wallachia. In this light, their supernatural capabilities from the way they drain the life of those they prey on or their immortality become stand-ins for the upper class's exploitation of workers and commoners, and the immeasurable wealth and power wielded by them that, to an normal person seems like the kind of thing that would take literal lifetimes to build. And I'm not the only one who's noticed this. In an essay titled Bloodsucking Structures, American Female Vampires as Class Structure Critiques, which examines the depiction of vampires and more specifically female vampires written by female writers through the lens of class, Linda L. Hinkle writes about how the original Count Dracula acts not only as a symbol of feudal dominance, but also of capitalist consumption, for the former drawing on writings from Paul Barber to describe him as a traditional feudal lord whose powers are limited to the area he rules, and whose neighbors are the serfs whose labor he so merrily leeches for his continued luxury while living quietly in his castle. The castle itself, a powerful trope in gothic literature, frequently represents oppression in all its forms, like social and economic class dominance and patriarchal authority, and for the latter, referencing common descriptions of capitalism through vampiric imagery, and directly quoting Ken Gilder, who writes, Modern capitalism here is, by its very nature, excessive, driven by irresistible force to consume and accumulate. Vampire Hunter D follows a traditional depiction of vampires as a ruling class whose abuses embody the cruelty and apathy their social standing allows them to get away with. But rather than wallow in the dire circumstances of such a setting, Bloodlust is set in a time when the nobles' power has started to wane, and as such has presented an opportunity for the lower classes to fight against their oppressors, to the point of hiring people with specific sets of skills to actively hunt them down. This is where D comes in. Being a Dampier, he has enough speed, strength, and dexterity to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a noble, unlike human vampire hunters who have to rely on more roundabout ways of getting the job done, like explosives, traps, specially designed weapons, and fighting in broad daylight. He uses the advantages that come from his vampiric heritage to hunt them down, turning the nobles' own powers and privileges against them to, in effect, tear down their hierarchy with the very things that let them build it in the first place. And that hierarchy is something D seems fundamentally opposed to. He rejects the superiority complex many nobles have about themselves, seeing it as nothing more than an excuse to be cruel and selfish. <laughs> Vale, la kizoku a eni kilo kino, sonai de vanaika. O 
He's driven by a strong sense of justice, something that's only emphasized by his caring nature. His cold demeanor may make it hard to notice, but when Layla gets injured, he goes out of his way to bandage her up. He takes her joke about leaving a flower on her grave seriously enough to make it a promise, and he decides to let Mayer live in the end. And as revealed by the old man in the horse stable, it's not a recent development for Dee's character, as he once long ago saved the children of the town where the old man lives, knowing he would probably still be driven out afterward for his vampiric heritage. D is an exceptionally heroic character in a lot of ways, one who does what he can to help those in need and righting wrongs when he can, even if he gets no credit for it. However, his drive to do right seems less like a natural instinct than more like something that's developed from shame. His noble heritage is a constant sore spot for him, as he's painfully aware of the atrocities they've committed and feels guilty for having any connection to it. Something only made worse not only by the implication that he's descended from the king of the vampires, the man who presumably would have led those horrible quests. <laughs> But also by his own potential to do things just as heinous. He's filled with loathing because of it, not only for himself but also for the nobility, driving him to stop Mayor and Charlotte from escaping so they can't potentially make another dampier like himself, and his decision to slice through a vision of his mother presented to him by Carmilla's castle. <laughs> Sure, he probably knew he got caught in a trap meant to play with his emotions, but that doesn't mean his emotions aren't being played with. His connection to the nobles only brings deep pain, and it seems like a big part of what motivates him. Trying to make up for his ancestors' actions as a way to ease his guilt-ridden mind, pushing him from solitary paragon to troubled tragic hero. One compelled to fix a world broken by relatives he was born too late to stop. This subtle layer of detail adds so much complexity to his character that only makes him that much more fascinating to watch. But he's not the only character defined by tragedy in this story. So this is a relatively minor thing, but I still think it's interesting to see the way the film subverts and comments on the tropes and societal situations surrounding its central damsel, because she isn't one in distress. Or at least not in the way the film initially wants the audience to believe. As mentioned before, it slowly becomes clear over the film that Charlotte's relationship with Mayer is genuine. They truly care about one another and just want to live their lives in peace, so much so they're willing to risk them in one way or another to do so. Yet Charlotte's love for Mayer is dismissed by those around her. Her family rejects it and goes so far as to hire mercenaries to kill her love and drag her back home when they decide to run away together, and even said hunters belittle and undermine her feelings when they find out. <laughs> Hell, even Mayor himself ends up putting her down, with his refusal to turn her into a vampire like himself, unsure whether he wants to put the burden of immortality onto her like that. He, in effect, refuses to let her be on equal footing with him. At nearly every turn, Charlotte's desires are demeaned and her autonomy restricted by older figures of authority, whether familial, structural, or brutal, and I think the obvious societal metaphor being played out here is only emphasized by the fact that, bar Layla, all of the people who put her down are men. To me, Charlotte's story comes across as one of a woman fighting desperately for her own agency in a world that refuses to let her make her own decisions. 
It's an especially fitting true line given the gothic tone of the film and the associations it has, at least for me, with the Victorian and Edwardian eras. Times in history defined by the intense personal and social repression of emotion and desire for the sake of maintaining a quote unquote civilized appearance. And whose restrictions were especially tight for women, as the rigid roles and expectations placed on them as domestic bodies, subservient caretakers, and shy mothers, both legally and socially, limited their ability to express themselves. Charlotte's story fits into the traditions associated with gothic fiction quite well. But there's an even more unnerving undertone to her story, as the film shows the way her desire for personal autonomy is manipulated. Of course, there is the obvious issue with her relationship with Mayer and the concerning implication of it being between a young woman slash girl and an ancient wealthy man. Despite how authentic it seems, there's an implied power imbalance that muddies its waters. And what's more, the very journey the two embark on turns out to be a sham in and of itself. As the one who promised to bring them to the City of the Night, a space station in orbit around the Earth that acts as the last refuge for vampires, reveals that she just wanted to take Charlotte's blood for herself. Charlotte's goal to take her life into her own hands is twisted out of her grip in subtle and not so subtle ways. Charlotte's story comes across to me as one about the ways people's desires, and more specifically women's desires, for autonomy are not only rejected and belittled, but in some cases actively toyed with for someone else's gain, and the miserable end it often leads them to. It's a simple tragedy, but one that still hits hard. However, the film does still have some hope to offer. For me, the main thematic throughline that defines Bloodless Story is its focus on death. It's something the original writer for Vampire Hunter D has talked about being part of his initial thematic inspiration for the character, in exploring the ways the lack of death that comes with being a vampire could affect a person. <laughs> この不動不死という絶対人間にはもう得ることのできないものを得ていながら、実は人間よりも不幸なのではないかという、こう、意思の、安寧さが人も付きまとい。なんかここのあの吸血鬼ものの最大の魅力だと思っております。It's always been an idea at the forefront of the creator's mind and the series' stories. But in Bloodlust, that focus shifts toward the more tangible aspects of death considering how much blood is shed throughout it. Almost every main character dies over its runtime, or at the very least gets killed... temporarily. The Barbaroi Mayor hires to protect them are picked off one by one as their confidence brings about their downfall, being outwitted, overwhelmed, and bested, respectively. Carmilla was not only slain by the original Vampire King for her crimes against humanity, but she's also finally put to rest by Dee's blade. Nolt dies slowly enough for the horror of his loss to sink in. Kyle's killed so quickly it barely registers. Borgoff is turned into a shell of his former self. Grove sacrifices himself to save Layla. And Charlotte falls into a trap she never noticed. The film even starts with Charlotte's father and brother confronting the reality that it may be too late to save her, whether they like it or not. <laughs> Most of the characters face death in fittingly symbolic ways, and as a result, the reality of it becomes an ever-present threat that haunts them across every step of their journey. But more than just the pain and semi-permanence of death itself, the film seems most concerned with what comes after. Not for those who've passed, but for those who get left behind. Hell, for as many problems as I have with the dub, I'll give it credit for hitting the nail on the head regarding what I think is the central question of Bloodlust thematic explorations. When the last vampire is extinct, who will mourn our passing? Will she? Will anyone? And I think it's fitting that Mayer's the one who asks this, since it's something the nobles seem especially concerned about. 
Being vampires, their immortality makes the idea of physical death a distant worry, but they instead grapple with the existential crisis of being forgotten. Their reputation as iron-fisted rulers only dwindles with every passing day and some just can't accept it. That everything they built is rotting away or being replaced and they try to take it back while they still can. Something I think is embodied by Carmilla, who literally refuses to let herself and by extension her reign die. <laughs> The nobles are scared that their time has come to an end and don't want to let it go, no matter who they have to hurt to do so. Ironically, it's something they have in common with some of the human characters, specifically Borgoff. He refused to let his and his brothers' reputation as vampire hunters die, even after Nolt and Kyle's passing, not wanting their deaths to be in vain. <laughs> He fuels himself with spite and grief and rage to get this damn job done, but it only ends up bringing about his downfall, as he falls for one of Carmilla's traps and, ironically, becomes the very thing he was trying to hunt. <laughs> Through Carmilla and Borgoff, the film emphasizes how the refusal to accept death is something that'll only bring about more pain and damage to oneself and those around them than it's worth. But blindly accepting the reality of death can bring just as many issues, as shown by Layla, whose childhood is riddled with loss, specifically of her parents, with her father being killed after trying to save her mother from a noble, and her mother being executed by the town after being turned into a vampire, and the resulting abandonment has filled her with an apathy that's closed her off from anyone who tries to get too close lest she be hurt or hurt others should the worst come to pass. She spent most of her life alone and believes that it's only inevitable she'll leave it just as lonely. It's a difficult thing to deal with and there's no easy answer as to how to do so. It comes and goes before you know it and takes so much and leaves so little behind. And it's easy to understand the extreme reactions people have to it, both in the film and in general. How do you come to terms with the hole that rips through your life? How do you accept that one day you'll simply be nothing? How do you accept that one day everyone you love will just be gone? How does anyone get anything done knowing that one day none of what we do will be remembered? That our memories and memories of us and who we were will be lost to time like dust in the wind or tears in the rain? But the film does offer some sense of respite. That for as painful as it is, some peace can still be found in it, either in finally being able to escape this mortal coil, or in just knowing that at the end of the day, even the loneliest of people will still be mourned. It makes room for new things to flourish and stops the world from stagnating. It's simply a part of life, and as terrifying as it seems, it's not something to be feared. It's what makes life what it is, that makes it worth living. To do what you can while you still have the time to do so, and so you should enjoy it while you still can. Or, to paraphrase the old saying, that you shouldn't cry for the ending, you should celebrate the journey. For me, it's Vampire Hunter D. Bloodless many tragic qualities that make it so captivating. But it's not simply because of the woe and catharsis it brings with it, or the unique atmosphere it imparts on its presentation and narrative as a result. It's because of the way in which it pulls some hope out of those tragedies, and reminding us that, no matter how bad things may seem, there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. And yeah, those are my thoughts. And Happy Halloween! And uh, if you can hear rain in the background, sorry about that, just sort of, you know, shit weather and all that. <laughs> anyway, I've been looking forward to making this one for ages. I adore this film and just felt like there wasn't enough talk about it, so might as well do it myself. I was kind of worried though, considering how many sections I was planning for it and how long those sections tend to be for these videos, I thought it'd end up being another huge one. But each section ended up being much shorter than I thought, so that's nice. 
I mean, nearly the half an hour is still quite a lot, but it's a lot less than what I was expecting. It's also fun to experiment with in terms of editing, because I wanted to try a more ambient sound focus approach for this video, just to challenge myself since I'm not good with sound based stuff, and I think the best way to improve is trial and error, and I, I, uh, I sure hope I don't end up fucking it up. <laughs> anyway, hope you are staying safe, wearing a mask, washing your hands, keeping your distance, and let me know what you think. If you agree, disagree why your favourite spooky animated film is, if you happen to have read the original Vampire Hunter D novels and why you think of them, etc. And thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this and want to see more, then check out my last video, where I talk about Doro Hetero's in-your-face chaotic energy and why I think it makes it work so well. Or watch me ramble about my top things of summer 2020. And don't forget to like, comment, share, and of course, subscribe to come fly with me. Hit the bell, stay notified, follow me on Twitter for more updates, ramblings, and poor attempts of humor. Follow me on Instagram for some semi-regular art stuff. And hopefully, I'll see you later.